Chairman of the board, uh, Mr. Alex Gorin, you know, President of Ben Gurion University of the Negev, Professor Daniel Shamovitz, Rector of Ben Gurion University of the Negev, Professor Chaim Hames, Ms. Adeline Zlotowski, Ambassador Dan Shapiro, dear colleagues, students, guests. Good afternoon and welcome to the annual Zlotowski event. My name is uh, Professor Sharon Pardo, and I'm a professor of European Studies in the Department of Politics and Government in BG and in BGU's Simone Weil Research Center for Contemporary European Studies. We have a fantastic program planned for you this afternoon. We will begin with the presentation of the Zlotowski Admission Awards for Outstanding Students, followed by a thought-provoking lecture by Ambassador Dan Shapiro, on a US policymaker's perspective on how authoritarian regimes challenge democracies. And then we'll move on to a panel discussion with senior researchers from BGU's Department of Software and Information System Engineering and myself on the topic of cyber politics. I'd like to begin by addressing the recipients of this year's Zlotowski Admission Award for Outstanding Students. This award is given only to the very best new students at BGU based on an average of their matriculation exam scores and their psychometric exam scores. This year, the award was granted to a total of 142 students. Our Zlotowski students consistently prove that their award is well deserved. They have maintained the highest grades at the departmental and faculty levels and often receive additional prizes for outstanding achievements. The percentage of Zlotowski students who pursue graduate degrees at BGU is significantly higher than that of other students. It is my pleasure to ask the students representing this year's Zlotowski Admission Awards recipients to stand up and be recognized, please. And now I'd like to call up Ms. Moral Peretz to speak on behalf of this year's recipients. Moral, please. President Chaimovich, Adeline Zlotowski, dear friends, Shalom, my name is Moral Peretz. I'm a first year student at the Department of Psychology and Brain Science. I was born in Bet a small town in northern Israel. When I was one year old, my father died of illness. Our family then moved to Rishon Lezion, where I grew up. I have one brother, Itamar, who is a year older than me. He is now doing his graduate degree in computer science at BGU. My mother is a very strong woman and raised us on her own, working as a bookkeeper. Despite financial difficulties, she always encouraged me and taught me to believe in myself. As a teenager, I was active in a youth organization named the Madatim, and worked as a counselor for Ethiopian high school pupils at risk. I also took part in a science program called Nachshon, where we prepared for army service. In the IDF, I served in the C4I Corps. It was clear to me that women are capable of doing meaningful army service, just like men, and I did. After I completed my officer's course, Operation Protective Edge broke out. I was stationed on the Gaza border for several weeks. I then served as a platoon commander of an operational route in the C4I, and later transferred to the Intelligence Corp, where I served as an operations officer. Over the past two years, I did over 70 days of reserve duty. Thank you. I have always wanted to work, to work with people, to eat, and help them. I love science and am fascinated by nature and the human body. I hope the combination between brain science and psychology will expand my scientific knowledge and satisfy my curiosity. Next year, I hope to realize my greatest dream and get into medical school at BGU. When the decision where to study came up, BGU wasn't the obvious choice. I was accepted to other universities and thought it might be easier for me to live in the center of the country, closer to home. 
but my love for the beautiful Negev region, the vibrant student life, and the lower cost of living for students, all these factors brought me to BGU. And now I know it was the right choice for me. I live in a rented apartment with two flatmates, and our neighborhood is full of students. We are like one big family and cook Friday night dinners together and help each other out. I also volunteer with the autistic teenagers and accompany them in special weekend trips. On these trips, I especially love the mornings. When the kids are so excited, they jump out of bed and hug you. Dear Adeline, on behalf of the Zlotovsky students, thank you for believing in us. We will do the best to impact the future. Bishotech na sesshinoi. Toda raba. Thank you very much, Moral, and Mazel Tov to all the students. Ladies and gentlemen, before I ask President Daniel Shamovitz to introduce Ambassador Dan Shapiro, allow me to say a few words about the topic of our event today. Cyber conflict remains in the gray area between war and peace, an uneasy equilibrium that often seems on the brink of spinning out of control. As the pace of attacks rises, our vulnerability becomes more apparent each day. Western countries cannot figure out how to counter authoritarian regimes' attacks without incurring a risk of escalation. The problem can be paralyzing. Russia's meddling in general elections in Western countries encapsulates the challenge of dealing with this new form of aggression. Cyber weapons and cyber politics are now used by nations every day, not to destroy an adversary, but rather to frustrate it, slow it, undermine its democratic institutions, and leave its citizens angry and confused. Cyber weapons and cyber politics are customized to fit so many different tasks and exploited by so many nations to reshape their influence on global events. Among the fastest adapters have been authoritarian regimes such as China, North Korea, and Russia, which deserves credit as a master of the art form. Russia's uses of cyber politics and cyber weapons is very simple, and it combines old and new. Stalinist propaganda, magnified by the power of social networks, such as Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and backed up by brute force. In the past year, we, a group of BGU researchers from the Department of Software and Information Systems Engineering, the Department of Politics and Government, and BGU Simone Weil Research Center for Contemporary European Studies, have teamed up to study this new phenomenon in a multidisciplinary research team, and we would like to share with you some of our knowledge and preliminary findings this afternoon. I now ask President Daniel Shamovitz to introduce Ambassador Dan Shapiro. President Sh uh, Shamovitz, the floor is yours. First of all, I'd like to say that this juxtaposition of social sciences, humanities, together with cutting edge engineering cybersecurity can only happen here at a place like BGU. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ambassador Dan Shapiro, the former ambassador of the United States of America to the State of Israel, and perhaps more importantly, a member of the conservative synagogue, Kilot Hod Adar in Kfar Saba, where he reads Torah once a month. Okay. Dan was born in Champaign, Illinois, where he learned what it's like to be a glutton for punishment as he was a lifelong Chicago Cubs fan and was told that he broke into tears a few years ago when they finally um, won the championship. But more seriously, he started his studies at Washington University in St. Louis. After spending a year in Israel, he transferred to Brandeis University, where he obtained his bachelor's degree in Near Eastern and Judaic Studies. Um, and then he continued on to Harvard, where he earned a master's degree in Middle Eastern politics. And from here, he left the academic track and went into the public track, 
where, the, where he started his illustrious career in public service, first as a professor, professional staff member for the House Foreign Affairs Committee, then as a legislation, legislative assistant for a senior for, and a senior foreign policy advisor for Senator Dianne Feinstein. There's a, this could go on and on, just a few of them. He sat on the National Security Council uh, under President Bill Clinton and was a con congressional liaison for the National Security Advisor Sandy Berger. Um, in 2009, he was appointed Senior Director for the Middle East and North Africa for the U.S. National Security Council. Focusing on Israel, he had a glutton for punishment. Um, he attended every Israel-related meeting and met with every senior Israeli diplomat and military official who visited Washington, D.C. Um, and he often accomp uh, accompanied the U.S. Special Envoy for Middle East Peace, George Mitchell, on his many, many, many trips here to the region. Um, and he played a central role in talks regarding the peace process and in strengthening military cooperation between the U.S. and Israel. He then served as ambassador from the United States from 2011 until the end of 2016. And during his tenure, in the words of Knesset Speaker Yuli Edelstein, Shapiro was an anchor in the frequently rocky relationship between Washington and Jerusalem. He participated in the negotiations for the $38 billion Memorandum of Understanding between the US for military assistance to Israel, which is still to this day the largest aid agreement ever between Israel and the United States. Since stepping down as ambassador, Dan is a distinguished visiting fellow at the Institute for the National Security Studies in Tel Aviv, and has reached his, will soon reach his, will soon reach his greatest honor, as he will soon become the father of an IDF soldier. Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for the uh, warm introduction, uh, President Chamovitz. Uh, it's, uh, of course, a distinct honor to be with all of you uh, today uh, on this occasion uh, of the meeting of the International Board of Governors. Thank you. And uh, the honorary degree, doctorate degree award uh, this evening. I'm uh, extremely grateful to President Chamovitz, to the Senate and the Executive Committee of the University, and, uh, of course, to the Board of Governors. Uh, uh, who are gathered here in Beersheba. And uh, it's a special additional honor and pleasure to take part in today's program in recognition of the Zlotowski family, uh, who are, I know are among the university's greatest supporters. Uh, I uh, thank also uh, Professor Sharon Pardo for the invitation to take part uh, in, this, uh, in this panel discussion on the subject of how authoritarian regimes uh, are challenging democracies, particularly uh, in the area of interference uh, in uh, the democratic uh, and election processes of, of, of those democratic states. I'll bring to this discussion today a uh, perspective of a U.S. policymaker. Uh, uh, and I hasten to add that my area of policy work, you've heard it a moment ago, has mostly been around uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship, our security partnership, the search for peace in the, uh, in the region between Israel and its neighbors, not primarily uh, around the issue of authoritarian regimes, undermining uh, of democracies. But given what has transpired in the last five years or so, uh, and given the current struggle underway for influence uh, in the international system between democratic and authoritarian regimes, uh, really no policymaker can, can ignore this challenge. So after I make my non-expert observations on this, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning during the rest of the panel uh, from Professor Pardo and the other experts here at Ben Gurion University who are conducting in-depth academic research into uh, the issue of foreign involvement uh, in the political and social uh, media environments of democratic states and, and what can be done about it. So my first observation about the subject at hand is that authoritarian regimes attempts to disrupt democratic processes in democratic, in, de in democratic societies need to be understood as part of a larger whole. In other words, we should not disconnect these disruptions specifically focused on our election processes from the larger competition, the larger struggle for global influence between democracies and authoritarian regimes. Whether they be declining powers like Russia, which despite its significant influence is a declining power, uh, or rising powers like China, or upstart middle tier nations that are determined uh, to pursue their domestic and international goals. That competition is playing out in many, many uh, other uh, realms besides just this, this question of disruption of democratic processes. Much of the competition plays out in what might be considered uh, external threats or the use of hard power by those authoritarian regimes. 
some of those governments engage in bullying and military aggression against their neighbors. Think of Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008 and its aggression more recently against Ukraine and the annexation of, of Crimea. In Asia, China has sought to uh, create facts on the waves of the South China Sea, asserting its territorial claims and uh, manufacturing new islands uh, at the expense of the claims of several of its, of its neighbors. Beyond the purely military dimension, uh, these authoritarian regimes display a lack of respect for the rules-based international order that uh, liberal democracies have labored to construct and sustain and expand since World War II. They operate instead on a might makes right logic and they don't feel bound necessarily by agreements or the rules of international institutions and choose to ignore those rules and those agreements that are, are inconvenient to them. And of course at home these authoritarian regimes are treating their own citizens and residents with a, a rough display of what we might call illiberal values. Harsh rhetoric and treatment of immigrants, of minorities, of women, of gays and lesbians, the stoking of grievances against perceived elites, academics, journalists, leftists, whoever, who are the scapegoats for whatever the economic and social complaints of their supporters are. They punish uh, the detractors uh, uh, and opponents uh, of the regimes, uh, either through extra legal intimidation or trumped up charges or exclusion from professional opportunities or violence or maybe the threat of violence from the mob or from state uh, organs. In quite a number of such cases, these very regimes who are governing in this style have actually arrived in power through democratic processes. Putin didn't, not a true de democratic process, but uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary did, Erdogan in Turkey did. Those were free and fair elections. But then their governance shifted to be anything but uh, what could be considered democratic uh, governance. And upon reaching power, they have dismantled or weakened uh, key democratic institutions and the separation of power structures that prevent the accumulation of power in liberal democracies. They use court packing or legal immunity for favored officials or state sanctioned corruption or the erosion of the rule of law and uh, the weakening of independent judiciaries or the ignoring of checks and balances voter intimidation, suppression, um, and more. And all of these features of authoritarian regimes are being applied to one degree or another in one place uh, or another as they learn from each other and uh, treat governments of this character as new models of inspiration. They're actually learning from each other how to, how to apply those tools. Now, I recite this sort of sad litany uh, only to place the threats that democracies face uh, at home from authoritarian states in their proper context as part of that broader competition between us. Uh, in many cases, the authoritarian states are not actually strong enough to take uh, on their democratic competitors in hard power terms. Thankfully, that remains the case in, 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 most, uh, uh, in most arenas. Uh, the United States and our NATO allies and our Asian allies continue to be uh, far stronger in hard power terms than our competitors. But these attacks on our electoral systems and our democratic processes then have to be understood as essentially asymmetric acts uh, of aggression uh, intended to weaken uh, the rivals of the authoritarians who, who perpetrate them. But you know, where we democracies might be able to stand confident in our ability to defeat our authoritarian challenges, challengers militarily, these asymmetric attacks uh, to defeat uh, on our elections processes and democratic institutions in some ways can wound us even more than a military confrontation could. They cause us to doubt what we've always considered to be absolutely fundamental about our societies, our governments, our values. And when a people begins to ask those kinds of questions about the system in which they live, it can have a highly corrosive effect on national identity and sense of purpose and social cohesion and, and even the belief in the system itself. So the second observation I have is that these are some very powerful tools that authoritarians are deploying against us. And the third observation is that there's a tremendous variety of tools uh, in the toolbox of authoritarians who want to undermine democracies at home. The most obvious are, of course, are the most direct, like financial support for like-minded political parties uh, in democratic nations. The Pulitzer Prize winning 
historian and Washington Post columnist Ann Applebaum, who uh, I encourage everybody to read and follow these days, uh, has documented uh, Russian financial support for a network of like-minded, far-right, often pro-Russian uh, political parties across Europe, in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Austria, and of course in Hungary. And in almost every one of these Western European nations, or in some, and obviously Central and Eastern European nations, we see the heavy influence of Russia uh, in their local politics, uh, open, openly uh, conducted uh, through, through financial support. But it's not limited to support for political parties. Russian funding now seems to be present in any election uh, that can accentuate discord in Europe and weaken European institutions like the EU and NATO. Most prominent are, are well-founded allegations that Russia, Russian money was funneled to supporters of the Leave campaign in the 2016 Brexit referendum. Uh, but similar allegations have emerged about Russian interference in the Catalan independence referendum that destabilized Spain in 2017. Just watch. There will be other such examples. But it's not just Russia. In the 1990s, uh, when I was serving in the Congress, uh, a wave of campaign finance reforms were enacted in the United States after revela revelations of an extensive, extensive effort by Chinese individuals and entities to donate to US political campaigns in violation of our campaign finance rules. And in 2018, Australia had to enact far-reaching legislation aimed at disrupting Chinese-funded influence campaigns. So it's not only Russia. Now, of course, perhaps most prominent in our consciousness in this area uh, are the web of techniques used by Russia to interfere in the 2016 US presidential elections. These methods are now, I think, reasonably well understood and well documented and, and quite widely covered uh, in, in, the, in the popular media. The hacking of private campaign email correspondence and then timing leaks either directly or through agents such as WikiLeaks to uh, do maximum damage to the targeted campaign or candidate. The use of social media to publish false news, which is then amplified by an army of trolls and bots such as those located in Russia's infamous internet research agency to disseminate those reports and create the impression of their mass appeal. And maybe while less certain, the actual hacking, the actual hacking of state and local election uh, authorities' election systems. Just last week, the governor of the state of Florida confirmed that the FBI has concluded that two Florida counties election administration software was actually penetrated and hacked by Russia during the 2016 election. The exact results of that uh, penetration is not known, but we all know how central Florida has been in uh, recent presidential elections. Now, while it's very clear that Russia conducted uh, those campaigns with an eye toward helping their favored candidate uh, prevail in the election, whether they succeeded and whether it made the difference in the election or not is beside the point. The interference is real and it's a genuine threat to our democratic institutions, and perhaps even more important, a genuine threat to the faith that our citizens have in our democratic institutions. That's why one of the most important, if actually in some ways the least publicized aspect of the investigation by Special Counsel Robert Mueller was the indictment of 12 Russian intelligence officers and 13 other Russian nationals and three Russian entities, including that internet research agency, for their efforts to interfere in the election. And these are not matters that are in dispute. Uh, no matter how the political debate around the Mueller report plays out, no one has disputed that these Russian individuals, entities, and intelligence officers were trying to interfere in our election. Uh, and so it's critical that when such interference occurs, the perpetrators are identified and their crimes are made a matter of public record. That kind of sunlight it's not a panacea, but it is an important deterrent and educational tool. But we should not be Pollyannish about the future. There are a range of even more brazen means of election interference that could yet be attempted. If you remember, in 2004, in the heat of a very bitter presidential campaign in Ukraine, the leading candidate who was considered less favorable to Russia's interests, a man named Viktor Yushchenko, was poisoned in the uh, critical juncture of the campaign. Uh, it caused him to become violently ill. It badly disfigured his face. He won anyway. And you know, you could say, well, that's Ukraine. Russia's always 
shown a willingness to act in a more bellicose fashion to those in those countries uh, that it considers parts of, part of its sphere of influence. But, you know, we've seen one barrier and one taboo after another uh, fall. And as authoritarian regimes feel empowered, uh, you can hardly rule out that physical threats to candidates who they consider hostile to their interests in future elections in a range of democratic states might be possible. More likely, perhaps, and probably more germane to the research done by the cybersecurity experts here at Ben Gurion University, are the new technologies that pose risks in democratic societies. These might be information specific, information technology specific, like the building, building on the use of social media platforms. Uh, the latest fear that we are watching for the upcoming US presidential campaign uh, are what are called the deep fake videos. These are videos and recordings, falsified videos and recordings that are uh, hard to detect but convincingly portray individuals doing and saying things that they've never actually done or said. It's coming. <laughs> or there might be more generalized cybersecurity risks, such as backdoor, actress, uh, backdoor access to uh, the electrical grid or to hospital networks or to the Internet of Things through all the different uh, Internet-enabled devices that could be activated on the eve of an election to cause chaos or mass panic or the breakdown of communication, or to tarnish a government or a candidate. The US government's current focus on preventing the deployment of certain technologies manufactured by Huawei, the Chinese technology company, uh, because they could permit nefarious access to our networks by Chinese entities, it's not primarily about elections. But clearly, such threats could be carried out in a way and in timing that would affect elections. Now, it's not really pleasant to think in these terms, to sort of imagine all the th threats and tactics and technologies that we haven't seen yet. Uh, but it's important that we do that. There's always the risk of setting up our defenses to fight the last war, and that's not sufficient. We have to imagine scenarios uh, of new technologies and new threats and of a greater number of actors getting into the business uh, and adopting these tactics, even if not on the same scale as Russia has done. Think about the dispute between the Gulf states, between Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates on one side and Qatar on the other. They have engaged over the last three years in a bitter war of hacking and eavesdropping against each other and those who they see as their political opponents. And that has spilled over into American policy debates with American citizens and political figures, emails hacked and uh, and exposed at certain times. These are our allies. Iran is a very capable cyber player, which has targeted both Israel and the United States. Under what circumstances might they try to influence our, our elections? China very certainly has the capability uh, and the means to scale their cyber uh, in interference efforts if they so choose. Very likely, so does North Korea. In a pivotal election where a number of these actors felt that their interests were at stake and the guardrails were down, it could be a free-for-all. And we know from the US experience, it doesn't necessarily require a nationwide campaign to have a national impact. The 2016 presidential election was decided by roughly 80,000 votes in three states, small margins uh, that could sway uh, a national outcome. What all of these efforts that interference in democracies have in common, and we've certainly experienced this in the United States, is that they capitalize on the pre-existing atmosphere of polarization and political tribalism and the media's tendencies to allow their coverage to be shaped and influenced by poorly sourced information. And then the technologies and social media platforms that reinforce all these trends. When we are as divided as we've become, and when there's already been as much of a breakdown in the trust, in, of trust in our system of government as we've seen, we're exceedingly vulnerable to these types of attacks by our authoritarian adversaries. That's why when we look at the range of possible solutions to these challenges, it doesn't actually really start with technology, as important as that is. It really starts with us, with citizens, and it really starts with education, not technology. 
We'll never be able to fully stop our adversaries from using the available technologies to attack us or to penetrate into our technology. Although we can deter them and we can respond. But it's like water. Their efforts will find a way. The first and most important means of building our resilience to those attacks is actually education. Probably no nation has done a better job of educating its public to deal with these challenges than Finland. Finland, which borders Russia, uh, has for decades been a target of Russian influence and interference campaigns, long before the era of social media and the current uh, wave of technologies. But there was a fascinating special report on CNN just last week about how since 2014, Finland rolled out and launched an education campaign aimed at providing its citizens with the critical thinking and digital literacy skills necessary to spot fake news, to identify disinformation, to fact check, to evaluate sources, to debunk false claims. And it's over now several years had done a significant, had a significant impact in dampening the impact of foreign interference efforts. Now you might say Finland is a, uh, also benefits from being a more kind of homogenous society. Uh, it creates a strong national narrative and, and probably lessens the possibility of these kind of widely diverging views that can give rise to the divisions that are so easily exploited by our adversaries. But even in more heterogeneous societies like the United States, building those skills, those critical thinking skills and digital literacy skills can blunt the impact of authoritarian attacks. The education needs to be conducted in schools and out of schools. It needs to be a multi-generational curriculum because people of a certain age might not uh, have the same facility with technology as, as today's students. And it certainly needs to confront head on that in deeply ingrained psych psychological reflex to believe whatever we hear or read that reinforces our own views, even when it's fake. What's also needed, of course, is strong political leadership. National leaders that treat authoritarian regimes' attempts to undermine our democratic institutions as national security threats and priorities that require the use of all our tools to deter and defend against and impose costs for such attacks. In the US context, that means a bipartisan commitment, transparently briefed to the leaders of both parties, that's conducted without regard to which party might benefit from the interference or from its disruption. That's critical. Candidates themselves should pledge to never accept the legitimacy of foreign intervention, even if they benefit from it. And they should start now by promising not to use hacked or weaponized information that might fall into their hands or become available, and to immediately notify the FBI uh, if, it, if it does occur. I won't speak at length about defense mechanisms. I think we'll hear more about that from the panel. But I want to highlight, uh, and I'm grateful for, the work of two former colleagues, Laura Rosenberger and Jamie Fly. They are a bipartisan team, a Democrat and a Republican, working at the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund in the United States in Washington. And since the 2016 election, they have published an impressive body of work that analyzes the threats to the United States and other democratic nations from authoritarian adversaries and proposes a range of measures, some already in the process of being implemented, some still far from being deployed, that we should use to defend ourselves. As they argue, we need to impose tough sanctions on a range of Russian entities and individuals involved in the election interference to go with the Mueller indictments I cited earlier. There's reputational risk and there's business cost of such sanctions, and that can have a deterrent effect on uh, future attacks. We can pressure foreign governments to shut down troll farms or bot networks, and where they don't, we have to consider using our own offensive cyber capabilities to target them ourselves. It's reported that the United States did just that uh, before the 2018 midterm elections targeting the Russian Internet Research Agency uh, that was so disruptive in 2016. We obviously need to harden our own cybersecurity defenses, particularly on election systems themselves. If you think about the cost to our democracy of an actual count of an election being hacked and being in dispute, and the cost of that to the faith of our citizens uh, in our democracy, it would be virtually incalculable. So, 
So, of course, we need to harden our defenses in the high-tech space, but we should consider retaining a low-tech element that is still used here in the Israeli election system, the paper ballot, because only that could be relied on for a recount uh, in a, that could not be hacked. Obviously, we also need to gain greater cooperation from social media companies. Social media platforms have been used to spread false information, and it's not just Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It's, it's others that have more niche appeal, uh, and you may not have ever been on Reddit and 4chan and Medium and others, and get them to label or shut down automated accounts that are more likely to be bots and trolls, remove what is obviously false information and false content from their platforms, and provide greater transparency uh, in their business model so users can more easily evaluate the information uh, and the sources that they see. And of course, we need to deepen our cooperation uh, with our democratic allies through the sharing of intelligence and best practices to help defend ourselves and each other from the attacks on democracies. I'm very pleased that in the time I served as ambassador, uh, the United States and Israel dramatically upgraded our cooper cooperation in the cybersecurity realm. Uh, I'm sure that has continued in areas, in ways that is not visible to me as now a private citizen, because much of this, does, uh, much of this is classified. But I hope very much it's also taking on uh, particularly the threats of authoritarian attacks on, on, on democracy. Certainly, we together have the, t the, the knowledge and the capability. And we're just two, uh, two, two members of the community of democracies that really need to stand together in an international alliance against the forces uh, uh, of aggressive authoritarianism. You know, at one time, that battle was conducted by tanks and planes. Today, it's conducted with keystrokes and clicks. And it's conducted with lies and with the truth. Uh, and it's conducted with attempts to exploit grievances and divisions and with the appeals uh, to greater unity that our own leadership must aspire to. That battle to sustain our democratic way of life will be won with our technology, with our resilience, and with our minds, much more than with any hardware. So I'm looking forward to hearing about the important research being done here at Ben Gurion University uh, on the rest of our panel. Uh, and I thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you today. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador, and very soon to be Dr. Shapiro. Uh, please come and join me uh, on the presidium. <laughs> Um, we are now going to proceed with the next part of our program, our panel discussion on cyber politics. Allow me please to call uh, my colleagues and friends to join us on the presidium. Our panelists are Professor Bracha Shapira, who is a professor in the Department of Software and Information Systems Engineering, as well as the Deputy Dean for Research of, um, of the Faculty of Engineering Sciences and a researcher at the Deutsche Telekom Innovation Labs and uh, Cyber Center at BGU, where she leads numerous research projects related to privacy and applications of machine learning methods uh, to cybersecurity. Professor Shapiro, please. Um, the next panelist is Professor Leo Rokach, who is the chair of the Department of Software and Information Systems Engineering. Professor Rokach is a world-renowned data scientist in his research in and his research interests lie in the areas of data science, machine learning, big data, deep learning, and data mining, and their applications to recommend the systems and cybersecurity. Professor Rokach, please. Our third panelist is Dr. Oren Tsur, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Software and Information Systems Engineering. Dr. Tsur is the head of the Natural Language Processing and Social Dynamics Lab in his department. Dr. Tsur's research mainly involves modeling and analysis of social network dynamics based on various social signals ranging from language languages uh, to patterns of online activity. Dr. Tsu, please. So ladies and gentlemen, just before leaving the floor to my colleagues and diving into the work that we are doing here at BGU, 
I'll open up with a short presentation on the concept of sharp power, which is actually the theoretical framework of our multidisciplinary research team that you see here on the Presidium. In 1990, the American political scientist Joseph Nye first developed the concept of soft power. Nye argued that the US is still the dominant world power, not only in military and economic power, but also in what he called soft power. Nye defined soft power as, and you can see it actually on this slide, as the ability to get what you want through attraction rather than coercion or payments. Soft power arises from the attractiveness of a country's cultural, political ideals and policies. When our policies are seen as legitimate in the eyes of the others, our soft power is enhanced. Over the years, the soft power concept was, fell, was well received by the global mass media and was widely used all over the world. However, this wide usage has sometimes meant misuse of the concept as a synonym for anything other than military force. The soft power concept was embraced also by the authoritarian governments and the authoritarian regimes that are investing heavily in their instruments of soft power in order to compete with the democracies in the realm of ideas. These illiberal regimes hijack the concept of soft power as part of a broad assault on democracy and its values. Soft power, however, used by authoritarian regimes are not really soft, and the international relations discipline was in a need of a new term to describe this new concept of power. The term sharp power is relatively new and was coined recently by Christopher Walker and Jessica Ludwig. Walker and Ludwig hold that some of the most visible authoritarian influence techniques used by the authoritarian regimes, while not hard in the openly coercive sense, are not really soft either. They argue that Beijing's and Moscow's initiatives in the sphere of academia, culture, media, and think tanks should not be seen as soft power efforts as they are neither a charm offensive nor an effort to win the hearts and minds. This authoritarian influence is not principally about attraction or even persuasion. Instead, it centers on destruction and manipulation. So what really soft power is, is, and you can see it on this slide. When using its sharp power capabilities, the authoritarian regimes pierces, penetrates, and perforates the political and information environments in the targeted countries. The repressive regime's sharp power techniques should be seen as the tip of their dagger. The authoritarian regimes are not seeking to attract or win over. They have come to manipulate, confuse, divide, and repress. They are simply seeking to manage their target audiences by manipulating or poisoning information that reaches to them, with the aim of polluting their audiences' understanding of the world. Above all, the term sharp power captures the malign and aggressive nature of the authoritarian regimes. By using sharp power techniques, the generally unattractive values of countries such as China and Russia are projected outward, and those affected are not so much audiences as victims. Now that we understand the theoretical framework of our research, uh, uh, and, and, and team and projects, I would like to invite Professor Lior Rokach, who will discuss with us social networks, machine learning, and recommended systems. Lior, please. Before we can uh, manipulate an election, we need to know the audience, the target audience. So I would like to show how we can deduce 
the political stance of a specific user by looking at his or her activities in an online social network such as Facebook or uh, Twitter. We can look at any kind of activities that characterize uh, the user, including, of course, uh, publishing a new post, sharing someone else's post, liking someone else's post, following a user, following a company, and so on. Obviously, there are some users that are reluctant to explicitly share its political view. So the main question was, can we still estimate at high confidence the latent political view of a user by looking at activities that are presumably unrelated to politics? And I would like to demonstrate this idea. You probably all know this map, right? It represents the last presidential election results on a county level. The red represent uh, counties that have voted for Donald Trump, and blue represent the counties that voted for Hillary Clinton. But let's look on a different map, like this one. This is a heat map representing the intensity of liking in Facebook a reality show called Duck Dynasty. Now, as you can see, there is a very high correlation between the likeliness of Duck Dynasty and the voters of Don Donald Trump. On the other hand, if we look at the following heat map, it represents the likeliness of a different TV show called Modern Family. And as you can see, it is almost a negative film of the first heat map. And it probably represents voters of Hillary Clinton. If we look at a specific location, such as Nashville, Tennessee, while Tennessee as a state was a red state, the area of the Davidson County has supported Hillary Clinton. And in fact, if you look at the Modern Family sub, uh, viewers or likeliness in, in Facebook, you can see that they preferred Modern Family over Duck Dynasty. <laughs> Apparently, a liking Duck Dynasty was a better predictor for Donald Trump voters than voting for George W. Bush in the 2000 election. So, uh, of course, these are a uh, correlation between large numbers, but in order to uh, accurately uh, predict the opinion of a specific user, we need methods that can address uh, millions of items, because this is what we have in a social network. We have millions of photos, text, videos, and so on. So we look at methods, in, uh, of, of machine learning methods that are uh, originally developed for recommender system. Recommender system helps user to select an item from a catalog that consists of millions of items. One of the most popular approach in recommender system is collaborative filtering, uh, which formulate the problem as a bipartite graph, where from one side we have the users, from the other side we have the items, and we try to predict the opinion of a user regarding a new item based on his previous opinions on other items and based on the opinions of mind, uh, like-minded users, what we call similar users. The most important feature in collaborative filtering is that it doesn't analyze the content of the items, but it looks only on the relation between the users and the items. Still, it is considered to be one of the best approaches in recommender system, and many large uh, websites are using it. For, for example, if you uh, look at a page or uh, a product page in Amazon, you get a recommendation that people who bought this product also bought the following products, right? Or when you watch a video in YouTube, once the video is over, you automatically get your next video that was selected by a collaborative filtering algorithm, and then is usually do a very good job. So we wanted to take this idea, but this time to use it for uh, predicting the opinion of a user regarding some political matter. We specifically test this idea on the UK-EU referendum in 2016. And in order to do that, we added two new items. One of them is the uh, item that represent people that support the Remain movement, and the other that support the 
leaf movement. We trained the collaborative filtering model and we got a very uh, accurate model with an accuracy of above 95%, uh, representing about 40% that supported the remain, at least in the Facebook, 45% that uh, supported the leave, and about 15% of the voters, we couldn't determine their uh, opinion, either because they didn't have enough activity in the social network or because they are generally represent uh, swing voters. But the most important conclusion that we got from this research is that we can learn a lot about your political stance based on your activities in the social network, even if you decided to keep that political view for yourself. So next time, when you're using social network, please keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rokach. Our next panelist is Professor Bracha Shapira, who will discuss with us some methodological issues and will present our own Brexit project. Good afternoon. So um, I would say that the era of big data is here. Uh, we experience explosion of data. This is what is generated in 60 seconds on the internet. Uh, in just 60 seconds. If you look, uh, for example, there are 300,000 3, 300, tweets in one uh, minute on, on the internet. That sums up to um, uh, half a billion tweets every day. And this is really, really a, a lot. And this explosion of the data are combined with the increased uh, computational power and the progress in uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithm actually is heaven for us uh, data scientists. And it's a very big opportunity to enable us uh, to explore, understand all kind of uh, underlying structure of a complex topic, connect the dots between different pieces of information and turn data into uh, insight. Um, also, uh, the traces that humans leave on the internet enable us to infer their uh, behavior and um, to actually even understand, as Lior presented, their political opinion and uh, may even aid in uh, strategic uh, decision making. However, um, only uh, a half a percent of this data is being today analyzed because it's really challenging to harness all this information. So there is still a lot of uh, work for us to do. So uh, our, our project is a collaboration uh, between the Department of uh, Politics and Government and our Department of the Software Information System Engineering. As the project was funded by the Ministry of Defense, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Doron Chavatzelet from MAFAT, uh, which is the Israeli equivalent to DARPA for enabling their research. Um, we had three uh, research students that were involved in the project, uh, Chen Tzaban, uh, Mayan Hasidim, and Dilaze Avi. Uh, what we tried to do is actually develop technology to find all kinds of interesting political phenomena in Twitter data. Uh, we focused, as a use case, on the Brexit referendum that happened in Britain on June 23rd, 2016. So we started with uh, only 10% of Twitter data for this uh, period, which summed out to 8.5 billion tweets. This is, of course, uh, much, uh, a lot of noise and too much to process. So um, our next challenge was actually uh, not to find the needle of a high stack, but first to find the right high stack. So what we did, we actually uh, filtered the data, taking or, um, uh, all kinds of turns and known accounts that are related to Brexit from our um, uh, domain experts in the political department, and to actually come up with uh, more focused data, more focused Twitter data that we know or we could assess or we could think that is related to Brexit, that um, um, brought us to 52 million tweets, okay? Uh, and the next challenge was actually um, to define our needle, okay? Um, we didn't know what we we're gonna find there. We didn't, have, we didn't know what kind of phenomenon we wanted 
to look at, and m what is more challenging is um, that there is no ground truth to assess our results. Okay, so um, I also want to emphasize that it's very challenging to actually automatically analyze tweets. If you look at this example, okay, um, it's not just about taking turns and analyze them, because if you look at this example, even between us, we had some argument if this tweet is about, uh, if, if from someone who is a remainer or a, a, a someone that uh, is for living, okay? So uh, it is, it's of course, if us human have an argument about this, you could think of how challenging it is for um, an automatic machine to, uh, uh, to classify it. So um, our first goal was to automatically um, classify between um, a, a remainers and live, liver users and to understand the behavior and maybe also to look uh, later for some foreign influence in this data. So we had three types of technologies that we used. The first is the NLP, or the Natural Language Processing uh, uh, Technology, where we actually um, uh, analyze the content or the text and the, the images at the tweet itself. So this is one type of technology. The other type is uh, social network analysis, where we look at the Twitter data as a network, as a graph, and we look at the connections and the interactions between different users and understand from this who is friend of who and all kinds of um, patterns and so on. And of course, this is all built up on, on above the machine learning, uh, machine learning and uh, AI uh, technology. And this all relies on our um, domain experts from the political uh, department. So if we look at very preliminary results, we could see um, that uh, after we know who are the leaves and who are the remainers, we could see that the remainers actually were very relaxed. They didn't think anything bad from their perspective would happen. And until the 22nd, they were not very active. They were less active than the leap, okay? And then on the 22nd, they, they uh, all of a sudden found out that they have some problem, okay? And then you see like a peak in their activity on the Twitter, but unfortunately for them, it was uh, too late. And uh, as we see at the result of the um, referendum, the Brexit referendum. So this is just a first example, and my colleague Oren, We'll present more later of what you could find out on how you could really uh, try to understand just from you know tweets and other social network data about uh, political uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Shapira. Last but definitely not least is Dr. Oren Tsur, who will discuss the differences between Professor Rockach's Facebook project and our own uh, Brexit project. And he will also surprise you with some findings from the 2019 general elections here in Israel. Hi. So um, thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And in the few minutes I have, I will try to um, tie some loose end and, and kind of highlight the thread that's uh, going from Sharon's theoretical perspective on Shar sharp power um, and, and Ambassador Shapira uh, talk about interference of superpowers um, and uh, Lioren Bracha's um, presentations about big data and how we could learn something about individuals. Uh, so Sharon presented um, a method um, that helps researchers or uh, malicious actors um, to identify and profile different people or users of social medias. And I think we could all imagine like what these people are like, what they like, what they don't, etc. Um, if I go um, through what uh, Professor Shapira, Bracha Shapira um, showed us. Um, it's much more complex, right? Because I have many more people and it's very messy and I have a large group of individuals here um, and I need to find who are the more, I would say, vulnerable people or susceptible people to influence um, whether I want to conduct polls or to have some sort of malicious campaign. 
Um, so the main question here, and what I'm going to talk about, is how you could or could not, or what happens when you try to look at a group of people, group, a large group of individuals, and try to turn them into an angry mob. Okay? Um, now, uh, I would just say that, again, from this mob to lots of individuals, what usually happens, um, and as, as Ambassador Shapira highlighted, we have many trolls and bots, which are automatic or semi-automatic accounts that engage with regular users. They also engage amongst themselves. They try to first create kind of facade of a movement. There is something going on and then target people that are more susceptible to the idea and kind of persuade them because, look, we, we, there are many of us ju ju just join us. Um, yeah, but I, I, I just want to say one thing, like when people, when citizens are um, coordinated, okay, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Usually like style of this angry mob, like the angry style aside, I think that in a thriving democracy, we actually want citizens and people to engage with each other, to coordinate, to discuss and be involved in politics. And that's why there is a big question which is very hard to answer is a question of legitimacy of the coordinations. And the main questions that we're going to ask is A, if this is a grassroots organization, or maybe it's a top down, and if it's top down, is it like a legitimate top down? Every party has their um, supporters and followers that they try to rally in order to, um, you know, make change happen, etc. Or maybe it's some foreign actor. Um, and whether foreign or not foreign, what are the means that are being used, either financial means and uh, the content like fake news and other uh, manipulations that are being used online. Um, I will just say that this is everywhere, like you've heard it, um, I think, a few times before. I will start with one thing that is related to Israel. Um, so some of you probably read that in the New York Times some um, two months ago like about a week before the elections. And it, the report, like it made big headlines here in Israel and it was basically reporting uh, that uh, Netanyahu is using a large group of fake accounts, it is called the click, in order to manipulate the, uh, um, the elections. I will talk about it in details because uh, I think these claims are wrong, um, but it highlights how hard it is to look at this data and how many, um, false smoking guns uh, are there outside and how hard it is um, from a scientific methodological point of view to get to do a proper analysis of the data. Obviously, we talked about the Brexit and Bracha mentioned it and I will mention it at the end and the last slides. Um, and there is a Mueller report that just came out um, two, three weeks ago. Um, well, came out, it's, it's questionable. There is a lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of things that were um, kept out. Uh, but again, in the Mueller report, there is um, some specific like sections and chapters that um, discuss and portray what happened in social media by Russian trolls, uh, with some names even that are mentioned here. Um, and we will get to that in these names and this report later. I will start first by talking about um, the Israeli case because it, again, it's very interesting because it's a like it is misleading to say the least, and it's just hard to process the data properly. Um, so as I said, the main claim, there are made two main claims in this report um, that said, A, um, that there are, there, like this click, click is a subset, a very tight, tight subset of the social graph, the social network that are very tightly interconnected, which is supposedly unique, and also that they also act together in temporal patterns, which means that when something happens, like there is a story that could damage, in this case, Prime Minister Netanyahu could, um, um, is breaking out, so they, they act together to put a spin on the story or to distract the media, the voters, um, the people on social media. So uh, what we actually did is to analyze much more Twitter data than um, the, uh, the group, um, it's a social activist that, uh, that, um, that uh, released the initial report um, did. So we had way, way, way more data that we analyzed and we managed to identify separate groups supporting different parties or different factions. So there is um, the red is the supporters of the right winged parties, the blue of the left wing, the yellowish color is the center parties. And this is a clique that they actually refer to in their report and we see a few things. 
A, we see that the organization of the network as a network structure is pretty similar. Like, there are not very big differences. And obviously, we could quantify it mathematically. And we could also see that there is a very strong correlation between the patterns, the temporal patterns that they act, which means there is nothing really coordinated. Like, obviously, there is a coordination here, but it's a legitimate coordination, probably, that looks just like any political coordination and what you would expect seeing from a group of people that is really involved in politics. You see that, the, for example, this, um, um, this time series uh, with the center at the uh, press conference with the release of the state controller report that was supposed to damage um, the ruling party, obviously. So you see that all groups have the same patterns in 12 hours before and 12 hours later, and the only or the major difference is just the number of people in each group. But the, the, the trend is basically the same. The correlation is really, really high. Um, so again, this highlights how hard it is to look at the social data. If you look at the wrong haystack, you get very strong results that are just not relevant. Um, if you look, uh, you could see things that look like coordination. And indeed, they show coordination, but it's not necessarily bad coordination. And you have to look at all these things very, very carefully. So I will just say that this case of this uh, New York Times report, uh, which we couldn't validate, we actually show that it's probably not uh, any malicious coordination. Um, we also did some other analysis, and we did find some interference and in activities of bots and trolls. And I will show it here. So this is another network of the retweets patterns in the Israeli or Hebrew Twitter account. You could see Bibi here on the left. And then there is, for example, this very strange um, uh, cluster on the right. Um, if you look at this cluster, obviously these are all bots. This is typical to bot farms and bot activity. We verified it manually after we found it automatically. Um, and I'll just show you some examples of what this bot farm looks like and how they kind of try to interfere with the elections. So first of all, the guy or the user in the center, which have very many followers, um, his profile picture of, is of an Israeli soldier, a religious soldier, um, wearing a talit, a prayer shawl, um, and with a tank in the background. Um, and he declares in his bio line, which is here under his name, um, I am a right-wing conservative woman in love, that's how it says in Israel, in love with Brazil and Israel, which is a bit weird, right? Um, so let's look at uh, two tweets, for example. So one is in Portuguese, because again, he's a Brazil lover. Um, and when you read that, um, I got, by the way, the translation here is done by Microsoft. And it, again, it highlights how hard it is to, be, to do like a natural language processing. Uh, the translation is a bit off, but it captures the, the, the spirit of the things, uh, which is a bit funny, of course, if you um, contrast it with the profile picture here. Um, so this type of tweets are obviously copy-pasted from other accounts in order to kind of mimic authentic behavior. But if it's not very sophisticated, there are these clashes between uh, um, the profile and what you actually say. Um, but let's look at what happens when he actually tweets in, in Hebrew. And again, the translation is a bit off here. Um, the word is here is not supposed to be listen. It was to be uh, to actually to, um, to put up with. Um, and again, you see that the, when it tweets in Hebrew, it tries to push and promote extreme views, um, extreme regional views about uh, a relationship between Israel and Iran and how Israel should, uh, um, um, should deal with it. Um, and again, this highlights what trolls and bots do when, uh, in interference campaigns. And it's A, to promote extreme views and B, like expand uh, the polarization in the political system. Um, there is one good thing about this, um, that this is not very sophisticated and the, the, like, um, and the effect of this type of bots and trolls, and there are many others. Um, this, is, this network is from one day or maybe one week. 
um, of Twitter data um, is very minimal, if not zero. It's a different cluster. It doesn't really relate to anything. No authentic user actually follows um, this uh, user. It's all bots. And again, so luckily, there is not much of an influence here. Um, but things can get much more sophisticated. Um, now, Bracha um, showed you this um, graph of the time series of what happens in Twitter in the Brexit campaign, definitely in the last few days, um, and how it played out. Um, I'm going to just conclude uh, with another image that gives the networked perspective of what happened in the Brexit, again, from the bot and Russian trolls idea. So it's usually it's very hard for us to say like with a 100% um, conviction, let's say, that this account is a Russian account or Russian troll or Russian bot, you have to, um, to, to, to use a lot of resources, sometimes intelligence resources, in order to verify that. But luckily, we had the Mueller report with few names of Twitter accounts. And also Twitter, again, with respect to the American um, um, 2016 elections, um, put out a list of over 2,000 um, Russian trolls and bots. And if we look at our Brexit data, but look at the Russian, at the identified Russian trolls and bots with the Brexit data, um, you could see an interesting pattern here. So first of all, this network is much more sophisticated than what we've seen in Israel, in the interference in Israel. Um, the other thing that you could see here is that it is mostly like the nodes, like the, the dots, the nodes um, that actually mention and refer to Brexit explicitly, leave or remain, are colored. Blue are the uh, leave, and the red are um, the remain nodes. So you could see that most of them um, promote the idea of leaving um, the EU, while there are some, like a much smaller number of nodes that promote the idea of remaining in the EU. So again, you could kind of sense here what the operators of these trolls, in this case the Russians, um, were trying to push. They were trying to push stronger for the leave um, of the EU. But also, they're maybe not less important is to um, throw some chaos in, again, to, to expand the divide and the polarization, with also promoting some extreme views that support the remain um, in different ways. Um, and again, this is typical um, to what's going on and what we see when we uh, talk to our uh, political science and sociology colleagues, uh, when they do more qualitative and deep analysis of the data, but on a much smaller scale. Um, and unfortunately, I would say that I think we're going to see more and more of these um, campaigns in a more and more sophisticated ways uh, because of two reasons. A, because it's just very easy, relatively easy to use. You could reach very many people with social media. And the other thing um, that um, AI and machine learning techniques to generate data, whether it's a big fake that was mentioned here or other data, um, and profiling user just becomes more and more efficient and more and more accurate. Um, so malicious actors will probably try um, to use it and push it further and further. Um, and that's it for now. Thank you very much. Before opening the panel to some questions and answer, we, we have some questions to all our panelists. And I'll actually start uh, with you, Ambassador Shapiro. Um, what do you think is the difference between the campaigns that we presented here today and old school propaganda and covert manipulation that was done by all the superpowers in the 20th century? I think the, uh, the main difference is scale and speed. Um, and because there's always been influence campaigns, uh, they've always played fast and loose with the truth. Uh, they've always sought to exploit divisions and to find like-minded partners. Um, but these technologies, the tools of, uh, of the modern uh, uh, internet, uh, social media, uh, other uh, uh, inter information technologies uh, allow a, a, a speed and a, and a, and a, and a saturation uh, that's much, much harder uh, to compete with. Um, you know, I, I, I think about the challenges uh, that, uh, it, uh, that exist to translate uh, the research uh, of scientists like, like we've just been presented 
uh, into practical, uh, practical recommendations for policymakers and how they can compete uh, with these kinds of influence campaigns. Policymakers and political leaders. There's an overlap between the two, but there's not, those are not identical. Um, and and it's, it's very, very difficult. How do you shape a communication strategy to counter these kinds of foreign influence campaigns when you simply don't, can't compete in speed and in budget and in the automated aspect of it. You know, we don't set up, uh, autom generally governments don't set up automated bot farms or troll farms to push out their positive, truthful messages. How do you uh, compete when you have a commitment to actual truth and facts against people who don't? Um, you know, and, and the, uh, uh, the slide that was uh, presented about, uh, uh, by, by, by Professor Shapiro about the, that spike of uh, leave uh, tweets in the final days, there was a spike of both, of course, but the leave far outperformed, uh, or, or certainly that spike was much higher than the, uh, than the, the remain spike because Again, uh, who was promoting it outside, people with, with, with more maybe resources, a commitment to per push a, a message that was not necessarily accurate, uh, and an automated capability to pursue it that uh, the, 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 the remainers uh, couldn't compete with. The other reason I think it's hard for policymakers and polit slash political actors uh, to compete with this is because there's a temptation to use these tools to political benefit, or at least accept the benefit that it might bring to your side. Um, and surely that does tend towards slowing a unified, effective response, uh, even when we can accurately identify uh, the challenge and the problem as, as the research here does. Thank you, uh, Ambassador uh, Shapiro. Uh, what are, and, and this is a question to all the panel members, what are the main challenges in these kind of, of research projects? Who would like to take it first? Lior, maybe? Uh, I need the mic. Mike. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, okay. I think in, in, in the first uh, case that I have uh, presented, the main challenge was how to get the ground truth. Uh, in order to use machine learning uh, methods, you need uh, training data. And in that case, for instance, in the UK referendum, you need examples for the uh, people that support the remain and people that support the uh, exit. And in that case, the, on, the only way we could solve it is to look at users that had a lot of, uh, that express a lot regarding one direction, especially the official campaigns. Mm. But not too much, because too much really uh, defined at all <laughs> in that case. Uh, uh, I would say um, that the main challenge is um, the big data. And the idea or the fact that uh, it is much easier to spread stuff and to hide within this big data than to find those uh, needles or to define those needles or to find those high stakes. And especially given that, as was mentioned here already, that uh, those adversary usually have the resources, they, have un they are nation-based and they have unlimited budget and um, uh, capabilities where us as the researchers or other uh, people need to um, um, you know, constantly update their infrastructures with you know, usually little budget and, and try to you know, look at all this growing and growing uh, capability and, um, uh, of this uh, adversary. So I think the, the, the fact that it's so easy today um, to put things in those, in, to hide in this big data is the biggest challenge. So basically nation states against uh, researchers, university yeah, researchers. That, that course, Oren, would you like to add something? Um, so I will, Lior and Bracha just mentioned the big challenges, which is a lack of, of gold standard and uh, the big data. I would add like the sort of the solution, which is a bit of a challenge by itself, um, in order to mitigate the lack of gold standard in scale that you need for um, proper machine learning, you have to cooperate with other people from different disciplines that actually know what they're doing, right? We know how to do some math tricks, but we, are, we do not really know anything about um, you know, uh, global politics. 
Um, and then we have uh, cooperation with uh, people like Sharon, for example, and um, his um, team, uh, which could direct us whether to where to look and uh, also help us analyze the results that we get, which we sometimes we cannot tell how accurate or good they are, if in actually meaningful or not. Um, and this cooperation is very interesting and it also will be challenging because we come from different disciplines, we speak different languages and build this uh, um, uh, collaboration in a fruitful way. Is a, it, it takes an effort but it's also very beneficial I think for everyone. Uh, thank you, Oren. Uh, Bracha and Yo, would you like to add something on the importance of multidisciplinarity in these kind of projects and, and, and maybe how common multidisciplinarity is in these kind of projects? I would say that in data science project, this is um, crucial. I mean, if you do data science for medicine, you have to have this uh, expertise and knowledge of doctors to lead you, to guide you into um, what to look for and um, give you some insights when you have results. So, uh, of course, also for politics, if we wouldn't have your guidance of turns and, and how to uh, analyze the data, it, I, I think the results will be much less interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think this kind of research is becoming more common, uh, basically because more data is available from one hand. On, on the other hand, we have more machine learning methods that are becoming mature for using them in such a, in such a research. I could just add, uh, I think it's critically important that there be a constant dialogue between the academic and the government and the private sector elements of this, uh, of this constellation. It's one of the things I'm so attracted to about what's being built here in Beersheba with Ben Gurion University and with the CyberSpark uh, and with the intelligence units that will eventually relocate to this part. You'll have that cross-pollination uh, of these three streams of academic, business, and, uh, and, and, uh, and intelligence slash government. Uh, actors who all have to be in dialogue with each other to be effective against the, the adversaries who are using these tools. I think this is a reason why the Ministry of Defense actually funded this research. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we are running late, maybe last question to the members of the panel, and, and that was actually quite clear from, from the presentations, but how do you really find foreign uh, involvement in big data research projects? Who would like to take it first? Owen, maybe you? Yeah, so again, this is just very hard and part of the thing is do collaboration and you find things that you're not sure about and you present them to domain experts. Um, another way to go, which I uh, think we did or started doing here, is use some uh, a limited number of known accounts, whether from the Mueller report, whether from what Twitter found. There was a very interesting case about the Chinese government man manipulating Chinese citizens, um, and it all started from a leak of, of a bunch of emails of um, Chinese trolls demanding um, their compensation for the Chinese government. So here we suddenly have, in that case, it's Chinese scale, so it was like few tens of thousands of accounts, um, only from one county, and this is how you start. Once you use it in order to, you, you start building your models, and there are, uh, they work reasonably well, um, you could extrapolate and you could try and use it on data that you don't know much about, and again, because there is no gold standard, it's not labeled, it still has to go through domain exports to just validate what you find. Maybe they will find some other patterns that are really interesting and important that we completely missed. Um, but uh, yeah, basically you, you, you leverage and extrapolate on, on small scale data that other people uh, produce. Thank you, Oren. Um, well, I'd like to thank uh, Ambassador Shapiro and all uh, the members of the panel. They deserve it. Congratulations, Dr. Shapiro. Uh, and I hope you all enjoyed uh, our afternoon panel as much as this unique multidisciplinary research team enjoys working and studying together. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at the uh, conferment of honorary doctoral degrees and the reception uh, and dinner following. Have a great afternoon, and thank you very much.